go a bit further. So without any further ado, uh, can I introduce you? <laughs> University and I haven't done a complete survey of all the universities in South Africa but my own experience with the people there we've done work with them etc I think you guys have got by far the biggest and most competent renewable and sustainable energy studies yes. program in terms of number of students in terms of facilities research mm. programs they're doing some amazing work there um, so uh, as far as background goes um, Samson Mokwele holds a master's degree from the University of Venda, PhD from the University of Fortaire. His uh, research interests, he's got a number of certificates in renewable energy, a mini MBA certificate, so he also knows how business works. Um, and he's published more than 45 research articles in peer-reviewed journals. Um, he is not just an uh, academic, he has previously raised funding and, and implemented a considerable number of renewable energy projects in the Eastern Cape. Um, his primary area of specialization in those is in biomass gasification and biomass digesters. And he is not only an academic and runs real projects in the real world, but he's a member of a number of committees that deal with renewable energy issues at national government level. I hope I've got that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, we're, getting a bit, we're getting to know each other a bit as these um, lectures go on, so I'm going to wave at you at about ten, at quarter to six. Okay. Just to, this time runs along. All right. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's good to be here. Um, one thing you didn't mention, which I excluded deliberately from, from the profile that I sent to them, was that I'm a former employee of this university. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's good to be back here. And uh, I think we're going to, to have a very good uh, one hour or a very good one hour, five minutes. Um, yeah, my lecture today is about uh, bioenergy, which is my primary area of specialization. I tried to make it as simple as possible. It's a very complex kind of subject. Uh, I don't know much of the complex part. I know the simple part. So you are in, in good hands in terms of that. OK. Uh, how do I move? Now technologies. I just used the, uh, the yeah. But it was moving not so long ago. Oh, you just want to move to the next slide? Yes. Oh, you got a pointer. Yes. Okay, that's... What are you supposed to do? That's... Okay, that's all right. Oh, yeah. Where's the technician? Yes, yes. Can you see Oh, it wasn't on. Was it not on? This thing was moving not so long ago. <laughs> Maybe the computer is frozen or something. <laughs> we tested it just now. Let me just get him, sorry. Okay. Let me just get hold of him. Sorry. Oh, there he is. He doesn't want to move to the next slide. <laughs> Looks like the computer is frozen.
can access the the compute the projector cable, then we can just put my computer through. No, they are they have been clipped. Oh. I know you can bring your PC. Okay, so this is the... Just got frozen. Yes. Yes. Maybe it's the USB. I've had used that USB in a long time. Yeah, that's fine. Because like before the lecture, you saw you were try we tried it and yeah, it, worked. it worked. Mm. Mm. Just to point. So, is there anywhere I can insert your. Yeah. Oh, um, no, no, there's, uh, there's an adapter. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay. We are back in action. Okay. Uh, we've lost some 10 minutes there, but um, we'll catch up. Okay. Um, in the first slide, um, I'm just, I just tried to look at the, the, the simplest way of defining biomass. Um, because we can't get to bioenergy before we start, we, we, we talk about biomass. And as most of us know, uh, biomass is organic material that's from, mainly from plants and um, living organisms. Um, and th there's always this uh, debate about whether it's renewable or not. And myself, I always say it's renewable. Uh, as long as the, the, the whatever you cut down, you also plant again. So for now, let's keep it in, in the renewable energy space. Um, it contains some energy, uh, and it, it gets that energy through photosynthesis. Um, there's a whole theory about how that energy gets to, to, to animals and to people uh, when we eat the biomass, and we'll talk about that as we, as we proceed. And when the biomass is burned, like what they normally do in most rural areas and in large industries, it, it produces the, it, the, the chemical energy stored in it gets released. So, and the, the biomass can also be converted um, into various forms of energy through different conversion technologies or processes. So we'll, we'll touch on those as, as we proceed. Now, here I'm just showing the, that you, you have the crops and what we, we, we call the unused resource or the waste. So we, we, we have waste to energy technologies. We have technologies that convert uh, the unused resource into energy. We normally say that your waste is not necessarily waste, it's basically misplaced resources. Uh, so if you place it where it's supposed to be, then it becomes a resource. And, and then you, you can attach value to it. So under the crops, we've got this that you can convert into this um, products and byproducts and many more. There's quite a lot of products. If, if I have to put all the products that you can get from here, I'll fill, I'll, I'll fill up this slide uh, with, with the products that will come from here only. And with this one, you can convert. You, 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 in this one, you get these types of, of um, waste that you can convert into this and many more other products using various te conversion technologies as you can see. So here yeah, I just try to see the, the to, to, to show the, the composition of what we call the lignocellulosic biomass, which is mainly your, your plant material. And you see that it's about 10 to 20 percent uh, ash, ash content and about 34 to, the, to 53 percent cellulose. Uh, lignin at about 15 to 20 percent and hemicellulose at about 13 to 31 percent. And you can extract almost all of these in various uh, ways using various technologies. Now, these are some of the conversion pathways. Um, you can convert biomass through uh, thermochemical processes, which are these processes here. Uh, biological processes, chemical processes, and physical conversion processes. But uh, since this is a lecture about bioenergy, we will be focusing specifically on some of these technologies because if we have to go into all these, we'll, we'll, we'll need about the whole year. Uh, so on the thermochemical pro uh, conversion process, I'll talk about gasification. And I'm very biased towards gasification because I did my PhD in, in gasification. So maybe that's why I chose that. And then um, 
I'll, I'll tell you which other one I've chosen that we'll talk about as we proceed. Now, <clears throat> what is gasification? What is a biomass gasifier? A gasifier converts wood and wood waste into charcoal, and, and then it gives off gas as a byproduct. So the, the gas that you get from the, gas, the, from the gasifier is a mixture of these gases, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, some water, and, and nitrogen, depending on your gasification agent. In most cases, your gasification agent would be air. So you, you blow air into the gasifier, and then you end up with a lot more nitrogen. But the, the gas coming out of the system has got between three to six megajoules per kg in terms of calorific value. So that's, that's good enough for the gas to ignite. You can burn the gas, and that's because you've got carbon monoxide in the gas, which is flammable, you've got hydrogen, and you've got some trace elements of methane, which, which are also flammable. So the next technology will be talking about more, generating more, more of methane. But in this case, you, you produce more of the carbon monoxide in the combustibles and, and some, some hydrogen, depending on on your gasification agent. Okay, this is how the process works. Uh, you've got a number of chemical reactions taking place inside the, the reactor. Uh, I'll show you some drawings of the reactor at a later stage. The, first, the biomass that you introduce in the reactor gets dried. So you've got drying that gives off some, some water and then it goes through a pyrolysis and then oxidation, then reduction reactions. During reduction reactions, that's where, that's where you get a lot more of the, the gases that you, the combustible gases, the carbon monoxide and, and the hydrogen. So these are the, then there's a, a number of chemical equations that I did not include in here. Okay, now we've got different types of gasifiers. And the, the gasifiers are divided mainly, are classified mainly into the fixed bed, the free diced bed, and the entrained flow. Uh, if you go into the, the internet, you'll, you'll see that there's a lot more because research is ongoing. But these are the main kind of type of gasifiers that are already proven technologies. And then the fixed bed the gasifier is divided into the updraft, the downdraft, and the crossdraft gasifier, depending mainly on where you introduce your air as, as a gasification agent, or, or where you introduce your steam if you're doing steam gasification. Now, this presentation for, for, for tonight is going to focus mainly on the fixed bed gasifier, and I'll talk more about the, the downdraft gasifier because if we have to go through all of that, then it's gonna be a long night. Okay, this is, um, these are the different types of the f fixed bed gasifiers. Uh, this is the updraft gasifier. You can see the fuel is introduced at the top, and then you've got those, the various chemical reactions that I talked about in my, in my, in my previous slide taking place. At the top there, you've got the drying zone, you've got the carbonization zone, We've got the reduction zone. This is where most of the, 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 the gas forming reactions take place. And then you've got your, your heat zone, which is where your combustion takes place. So because the gasifier is a self-contained self unit, it, 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 it kind of gets its own energy from internal when it's, when it's burning the, the material. So that's where you, you've got, here you've got combustion taking place. And then you've got your ash grate, and then your air is introduced at the bottom here. So the air gets in at the bottom and then it goes up and then your gas gets out at the top. That's why we call it an updraft gasifier because the, the, the air is going up like that and then the fuel is going, it's moving down and you end up with ash there. And then this is the, the, the cross draft gasifier. Again, fuel is introduced at the top and then You've got your drying zone, your carbonization taking place there, and this is where your combustion takes place. But in this case, we, we call it a cross draft because your air is introduced on the side and it, it exits, the gas exits on the side at the same level. That's why it's called a cross draft. And then you've got your ash pit at the bottom. 
And then we've got your, your downdraft gasifier, which is the one that will focus on where, again, you introduce the fuel at the top, and then you've got drying taking place there, you've got carbonization, and then this is where the fire is burning. And then you've got reduction reactions taking place at the bottom here. And then those give, 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 give rise to, to the gas that you need. And then the gas comes out at the bottom. Now, in terms of efficiency, then your downdraft gasifier is much more efficient because most of the, of, of, of the, the, the organics that, that, that are formed up here, they end up passing through the hot bed of charcoal and then they get destroyed or converted into the, the, the gas that you need and then they exit here. And also in terms of the tar formation, uh, you get a lot less tar formed in the, in the downdraft gasifier as opposed to the updraft gasifier. So this is our example for tonight. We're going to talk more about the, the downdraft gasifier. So what I'm going to do now is just to go in, I'm going to take you through the schematic, showing you the various components of the gasifier. So this is the main component, which is your, your gasifier or the reactor. And these sections, one, two, three, four, five, these are the various sections that, that I talked about. This is where your, your combustion takes place. This is where your reduction takes place, reduction reactions takes place, the, the drying takes place there, and then the carbonization takes place here. And then from, from the reactor, you have the cyclone. Now, from the cyclone all the way to this unit here, this is the, this filter here. This is just basically for filtering unwanted or foreign uh, uh, substances in your gas. For instance, the cyclone removes most of your, your, your coarse um, carbon particles coming from, from the gasifier. So you have coarse and fine carbon particles as well. So about 80% of your particles that have, that have, uh, have got particle size of a more than five microns get uh, retained here in the, in the cyclone. Uh, when I did my PhD, I focused more on, this, uh, on the efficiency of this system as well, of, of the cyclone as well. So from the cyclone, you have a, a gas scrubber. The gas scrubber works with a cooling pond here at the bottom. What happens is you've got sprays on top here, and, you, and then the gas scrubber is filled with charcoal. Again, it's for removing some of the fine particles that passes through the, the cyclone. The, mainly the ones that are, that are of much less um, particle size. And those get retained here through absorption because they, they go through the charcoal, the, the hot bed of, the, the, the bed of charcoal, and also the, the water plays a role in, in terms of removing them. And then they go into the cooling pond here. And then you've got, you've got water that's pumped into the, 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 the scrubber and then it just recycles for a certain period and then you later remove that water with the, with the, with the fine particles. And because there is water, uh, cold water interacting with the atmosphere here, you get gas cooling. So the gas coming from the gasifier there is at very much high temperature, about 500, 600 degrees Celsius, depending on the type of gasifier that you're using. Uh, in, case, in this case, because the gasifier is a downdraft gasifier and the, the gases pass through the hot bed of charcoal, it, it's at much higher temperature, and it also depends on the, on the load of your engine that, that you're using. So you've got, you've got, you, you have gas cooling here, so from about 500 to 700 degrees Celsius down to room temperature. So there's, there's a lot of losses there, and one of my PhD students looked at harnessing uh, some of that energy here at the cyclone, so we designed a cyclone heat exchanger, or what we can call a water jacket that has got water in it and it's surrounding this thing. So we harness the energy through the surface of the cyclone and we could get to boiling point with that uh, kind of device. Okay, and then we've got a particle uh, interference filter here. Now this one is uh, kind of a, 
a, a drum, a huge drum filled with sawdust, very fine sawdust, to also capture some of the very fine particles that, that, that are not wettable, that, that, that go past through here. So we capture them here. And then finally you have the, the paper filter, the safety filter. This one is just like the filter that you have, the air filter that you have in your car. Uh, it's, it's mainly to, for, 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 to capture whatever that may pass through this, this, and that. Then it gets captured here for, for the safety of the engine. And then finally, you have the, the engine that's coupled to a generator. So what happens in the whole process is you produce gas here, you clean it, and then you send it to a gas engine that has got a generator, you run the gas engine, so your, your gas becomes your fuel. And then you run your gas engine, and then the gas engine produces electricity because it's got a generator at the back. It runs a generator at the back. And then you've got your carbon neutral emissions from, from the engine. So that's basically how the whole um, gasification process works. In, with most gasifiers, that's how it operates. Uh, whether you have a downdraft, updraft, entrained flow, fluidized bed, that's, that's basically the process. Uh, I, I decided to show this. This is just a, an R&D unit prototype that, that we, we developed. Uh, this is the, the main unit, which is the gasifier. And then this is the, the, the gas scrubber where the gas is, gets cooled. And this is the, our little cooling pond on the side where we pump the water there. And then there is your sawdust filter there. The only outstanding thing here is the engine. We don't have the engine here. But this we can run and then we can bend the gas. We can do a lot of experiments with it in the lab. Then get the real stuff. Um, this is an example of the gasifier that I implemented at a village. I installed a 150 kVA unit at a village called Melani. And you can see this is the, these are the wood pieces that we got from, from a, a nearby sawmill. And then that's where you, you load them, and then you close on top there. And then here you can see the guys trying to, to ignite the, the gasifier. This is a downdraft system, so they ignite it at the bottom and then we produce electricity from here, from running the engine, and then we've, we, we installed a bakery for a, for a community to run the bakery, and then you can see them baking the bread there, and then here are some very fast customers of the bakery. <laughs> so I used to, to tell people that it's from wood all the way to bread. So you're producing bread from burning wood, from, from converting wood. Um, these are some of the things that I used to do. And these are some of the various components of the gasifier. You can see the, you can see the reactor here. It's, it's a very big unit, uh, maybe four or five times my height. And there's your gas scrubber there, and there's your sawdust filter there. From here, you can see your engine safety filter somewhere there. And then from there, the gas goes to the gas engine. This is the gas engine that we have at the village. And that's me there at, um, in one of the gasifier plants at ESCOM uh, some time ago when I was starting with the research. And uh, this is the, the full gasifier implementation thing at, at Melani Village. Okay. Now, that's, uh, that sums it in terms of gasification. There's quite a lot that we can talk about. But uh, I thought if I just show you some of the pictures with some of the bread, even though we can't touch and smell it now, so going back to the conversion pathways, the second technology that I want to talk about is biological conversion. Um, in terms of biological conversion, we've got anaerobic digestion, we've got fermentation, and then we've got enzymes. And in this case, I'm going to focus on anaerobic digestion. So I, I, I do a lot of work in, in RN, RN, anaerobic digestion. And those of you who don't know what anaerobic digestion is, basically um, all our stomachs are anaerobic digesters because basically the digester converts organic waste into gas in the absence of oxygen. That's all it does. So in, when we eat the food, 
We can call that food the feedstock. So you eat the food and then it gets into the stomach and then it gets digested because there's bacteria in the stomach that acts on the food and then afterwards you get the effluent which still has some energy which we send to downstream to, to, the, to, the, to the sewage treatment plants and we can still extract some gas and energy from that. So basically this is that's, that's the most basic way of explaining it. But this process happens in three basic stages. And it, um, those, those stages, I'll, I'll go through the stages at a later stage. And those stages are affected by a number of factors. And temperature is one of the big factors affecting uh, uh, digestion uh, process. And as you know, our, the temperature in our stomachs is quite uh, stable, so you need to to, to also take that into consideration when you when you design your 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 your, your digester. Here I just showed the various temperature ranges at which optimum digestion takes place, and the temperature ranges at which uh, digestion uh, kind of drops. Okay, so these are the various stages in the in the digestion process. You've got the hydrolysis, which is an enzyme mediated stage where the, the, the organic compounds are broken down into soluble organic uh, uh, components, such as amino acids and, and the likes. And what happens in the, in the entire uh, process, uh, one stage, it, at one stage, the material is converted to a, 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 the components that are suitable for the, the bacteria that's going to take it from that, that other stage to the next stage. And then it proceeds like that. Then you have acidogenesis taking over from hydrolysis, converting some of the, the material from hydrolysis and making it ready for acetogenesis. And then you get some acids being formed in acetogenesis. And then you get to methanogenesis. And then the products of the various, the, 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 the previous stage are now used to produce uh, methane and, and, and mainly uh, carbon dioxide and methane. And the gas of interest for us is methane. So we get about 60% methane out of this uh, entire process. So here you can see the various stages uh, divided here. And then you've got your first step, which is hydrolysis. And, and then you've got your second step, which is um, acidification. And then the, the third step and the fourth step where your biogas gets, gets uh, produced, and it's mainly methane and carbon dioxide. You, we've got other hydrocarbons that are in, in very low quantities in the gas, which we are not very much interested in. But in certain cases, you, you also get uh, uh, impurities such as ammonia, especially if you are doing, you are digesting things such as your, your uh, chicken litter. There's quite a lot of ammonia that, that comes into the system, which you need to, to take into consideration when you design your downstream process for, for cleaning the gas. So you need to scrub it so that it doesn't cause corrosion in your equipment and all that. Okay. Now, in terms of the energy that you get from, from digestion, um, on average, you get about 25 kg of, of waste will give you about 1.7 kilowatt hour of energy. So in, in, in actual terms, you get about 1.7 units, uh, in, if, if I have to say it in the municipality or ESCOM language, when you buy electricity, they sell it in units. So about 25 kgs will give you about 1.7 units of energy. And, but that varies depending on a number of factors, temperature, your, the type of waste that you're using, because some, some of, the, of the waste, for instance, if, if you take animals, the different animals have got different digestion rates. So some animals are much more efficient in terms of taking the energy out of the, of, of, of the food. Some animals are less efficient in terms of taking the energy out of the food, which means you feed them more to, to, for them to, get, to gain weight, and others you feed them less for them to gain weight. And in the end, the waste that you get if it, 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 it got more energy, then you get this on average. And if it's got less energy, then you get a bit less on average. Okay? 
So the, the energy can be used for, for, for direct heating. You'll see in some of the photos as I proceed. And it, it can also be used for power generation purposes, just like I indicated with the, the gasification process. Even the gas from the gasifier can use it for direct heating or, 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 or electricity generation. Now, there are different types of, um, of uh, digesters. Um, you have, they're classified mainly into the batch type and the continuous type. Uh, the batch type, uh, uh, like the name says, you, you get a batch of feedstock, you put it in, you close it, it digests until the end. You get the gas from there as it digests. And at the end of the digestion process, when there's no more gas being produced, you take it out and you put new feedstock. So this is not good, especially if, if you are running a commercial setup or if you are running a digester for your home, because you don't want to be taking stuff in and taking it out. You want a continuous type. Like the name says, this one is continuous. So this one, you feed continuously on a daily basis, and it can give you more gas, because the more you feed, the more gas you get out of the system. So the batch types, it's, uh, we use them mainly in, at laboratory scale, uh, in at the lab when we want to do testing of the, of, of the various materials, we, we use the, the, the batch type digester. And these two are also divided into the fixed dome, the floating drum, and the balloon type. Now, with the balloon type digester, you don't, you don't all normally get the continuous digester. So you, you, sorry, the batch type digester. You mainly get the continuous digester. And the floating drum, it can be batch type or it can be continuous. The fixed dome, it can be batch type, it can be continuous. OK, and um, I'll go back to some examples uh, at a later stage of um, the digesters. but. I thought I should touch on the advantages of the biogas that you produce from this. Uh, you get methane gas that you can use, again, for cooking, uh, lighting, water heating, and also to generate electricity. You also digest organic waste, so you can get your kitchen waste diverted into the, 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 the digester, as long as you don't, uh, you don't divert it with the, 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 what do they call these things that they use to wash? Um, to, to wash the dishes, the disinfectants, yes. Yes, so that, those will kill your bacteria. <laughs> and then you'll end up not, not, having, not producing gas. Um, and then it also prevents methane gas from entering the atmosphere. So you burn the methane gas and you, you, you use it. And then we, you can also produce organic compost. So from the, the effluent, when it comes from your digester, it's rich in nutrients. So you can divert it into your, your home garden. We've installed digesters where we, we diverted that into the home gardens, and people got some good uh, fresh produce from there. And then it can also treat organic waste before the end use or before uh, the disposal. You'll see, I think, towards the end, my last slide or something, where I'm showing the, the destruction of uh, some of the bacteria in the, in the digester. And then we get to the interesting part again with photos, um, where I'm showing you some of the examples of the projects that I implemented in the past. I've installed about 200 to 250 of these digesters um, in my previous job where I was doing some research on this and also community projects. So especially with communities that have got uh, cow, they've got, that have got lots of animals, cow dung, sheep, goats, and all that. So we, we do experiments in the labs, and then later we go and build this system. So this is a fixed dome digester uh, built of bricks. This is a six cubic meter fiberglass uh, fixed dome digester. So as you can see, we build it out of bricks, and it's round, and then we get a fiberglass dome. We come and put it on top here, and then we just make sure it's, it's uh, gas tight 
here. And then you've got your, your, your inlet here. That's where you put in your feedstock. And then you've got an outlet here where, where you get your, your effluent coming out. So normally we just connect a pipe on this side, on the, on the overflow, and then it goes to the, to, to, to the home garden. And then you, it, it, it helps in, with irrigation and also with um, uh, fertilizer. Okay, this is uh, another example project. Okay, this one here we converted the, this is your normal sewage tank that, uh, that, they, that, they, that is in the, in the, out there that they use for, for, for sewage in, in places where they don't have um, municipal uh, works. So we converted this into a digester. So we just have a, an inlet pipe here going in at, on the other side, and then you've got an outlet pipe on the other side and then you build the outlet here, and then you build the inlet using the bricks. <clears throat> and then you make sure that it's gas tight on top here. And then you, have your, you feed your feedstock there, and then it accumulates, and then it comes out here. So this is about 2.5 cubic meters uh, digester that we, we got out of this. And this, the, good, the good thing about this is that it's, it's quite cheap to build, because the, 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 the tank itself is about... 2,000, 2,300 rand, and then you, you, you buy your bricks and, 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 and then your, your cement and stuff. So for, for less than 5,000 rand, you can have the structure. And, and the advantage with this is you can also do something like this at home uh, where you, your, your, your sewage, before it, it goes to the municipal works, it comes in through here. And then if you, you have your outlet on this side, and then it accumulates on its own. You don't have to touch it. Don't worry. And then it goes out through a pipe, and then it flows into the sewage. And then you get the gas from there. The gas doesn't smell. It's, it, it smells like rotten eggs. It doesn't smell like the other things that will come in here. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> OK, so this is another example project. Uh, this is a balloon type digester that we installed in a village somewhere and it's a 10 cubic meter digester. These are made mainly in China and in South Africa we just get them in and then we implement projects and then we do research on the, on the gas production side. Uh, this photo here I was inside the university in our lab and um, yeah we have a number of digesters, we had a number of digesters at the, in campus in our research uh, area. And during lunch, we just uh, cook using biogas and have some, some food from there. So this, was, this is me cooking during lunch. And it tastes so nice. <laughs> and uh, continuing with the example projects, this is another type of digester. Fixed dome, but this one you build the entire dome using the bricks. So there's some skills that is needed there to, to be able to do this. Uh, this is the guy who builds them a lot. Uh, this is at a school in somewhere in the Eastern Cape. They, they used to cook using LP gas, and, but they would still bring in cow dung to, 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 to complement the, the LP gas that they had. And sometimes they would use more cow dung than the, the LP gas because it was too, too expensive. So we went there and installed this digester. And now they, they started cooking using the cow dung instead of the LP gas. And they saved a lot of money out of that because they were bringing in kelp, uh, cow dung anyway. And they were burning it inefficient. Now that we brought in an efficient system, which is even much healthier. They, they don't have any smokes coming out of the, out of the gas and, 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 and anything like that. Now it gets bigger um, at industrial scale. This is one of the big projects that I implemented at the Investor of Forte. This is a 5,400 cubic meter lagoon digester. Um, this, at, at industrial scale, you have fixed domes, you have lagoons, you've got also balloons. But you need to look at your feedstock. You do feedstock analysis to find out what type of digester you can I use in this feedstock. So we installed this. This is just a, a big hole that's dug on the ground, and then you line it with plastic, thick plastic. 
And then there's a special way of welding the plastic so that it doesn't leak and leak into the ground. And then later on, you put a, a cover on top here. Here, that's where the cover comes in. We put water here, and then you, the cover comes in here so that the, you, you, you don't have any gas leakages because the gas leaks like nobody's business. So from here, you get the gas sent to this uh, gas engine standing there. And this is a 100 and, this is a 90 kilowatt engine. So we had two, two 90 kilowatt engines at the university, and then we will run this out of um, uh, pig waste. So they've got a pig area, they've got about 1,000 sows, and then we pump the pig waste into the digester. All this that you're seeing at the bottom here is pig waste before we cover the digester. And then from here, you pump the, the pig waste into the pastures. This, they've got a dairy, these are, these are dairy pastures. So you pump the pig waste from, from the digester after the digestion process because it, it has now been processed, <laughs> no, no, no dangerous bacteria, and then you pump it into the, the pastures, and then you do nutrient recycling that way. And this is, uh, I think, my last slide before I say thank you. Uh, here, I'm just showing the, the various bacteria. I can't even pronounce this, the names of these bacteria because they are very dangerous. <laughs> if you say their name, they may go after you. <laughs> so you can see from the regression analysis that when you start with the number of days, normally the retention time is between 10, 10 and 30 days. From the time you put, you put in your, your feedstock to the time that it gets out, it takes between 10 and 20 days, depending on your feeding rate, of course. But we, we encourage people to keep the feedstock in for about 20 days for, so that you get maximum energy output from it and maximum bacteria uh, destruction out of, out of the process. So you can see from here, from the regression analysis, that you start with very high bacterial load. And in the end, you, you end with very low bacterial load in all of these graphs. So it, it kind of helps in terms of waste management and waste purification. Thank you. results came from a continuous process. We measured this in the, in the balloon type digester, 10 cubic meters. Thank you. Uh, you are installing quite a number of these in various villages. Who is funding this? The, enough of your research. Yes. <laughs> they, were, they, they are funded mainly by government. Um, some of them, most of the, the digesters that are installed were funded by SANEDI, the South African National Energy Development Institute. It's the subsidiary of the Department of Energy. So they do the research part and the community projects part, the demonstration parts. So they gave us funding for that. And the Eastern Cape Department of Rural Development, I presented the proposal to them and, and they funded uh, part of the digesters, the Department of Science and Technology, because some of the, 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 the technologies came from our research, so for technology demonstration, then they fund us. So it's mainly national government. Yes. Uh, I'm just kind of interested in the, if any studies have been done, in the kind of uh, amount of uh, energy in dried cow dung, burning it as a direct fuel to heat, uh, uh, kind of cooking possible versus running through dried 
digester. Mm -hmm. The other benefits of running it through digestion is like not having pollution and soup. Yeah, the, the You, you lose a lot more by, by burning it directly um, because you've got a lot of... Remember, energy is about um, conversion from one form to the other. And during the conversion, you've got losses. Uh, there's no system that's 100% efficient. But when you burn it, especially in open space, you've got a lot of air coming in. You've got a lot of losses uh, happening there. But if you put it through the digester, <coughs> It becomes much more efficient because it goes through the stove, and you, in most cases, your stove is inside the house and all that, so you don't have a lot of losses if you do it through, through digestion. And the, 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 the easiest way to demonstrate that is if you look at the amount of, of, of cow dung that you need to burn to, to cook one kg of food versus the amount of cow dung that you need to convert through a digester to cook one kg of food. It's quite different. Out of 25 kg, you get one, 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 almost two hours cooking time but this, from the digester. But from the same 25 kg, you can cook for, 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 for almost two hours in an open or in a combustion kind of environment. But if, if your combustion is controlled, and, uh, and also there are issues of CO2 emissions and all that, but if your combustion is controlled, then it's a different story, but the efficiencies can't be compared. Can you just finish, even in the case of uh, rocket stoves and highly efficient contained stoves? Yeah, that's why I'm saying if, it's, if, if your burning is contained, then it's a totally different story. So there is need for quantification of that kind of efficiency in, in that case. But I don't think it will get to the digester efficiency. If I can just add a, a one um, item there. You, you mentioned this, but it's very important, and that is the particulates. Yes. Burning, because particulates is one of the biggest health problems for yes. children. Yes. Uh, are, you, are you asking an energy question? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they say you should be here. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's something that I want to know about your, your research and the presentation. And the so mm. I just want to know, like, um, what really motivated you to conduct this kind of research, basically in South Africa? Apart from that, um, out of your research, uh, there are, um, there is a mission. I can say there is a mission sort of carbon, carbon monoxide, or sort of carbon dioxide, uh, not mm. carbon dioxide, but carbon, di carbon monoxide, mm. gas that can cause pollution to the, uh, so what kind of, um, what kind of features did you take into consideration while conducting this kind of uh, research? It's, it's really an, inter an interesting study. Yeah? Mm. But then I really want to know some of the things that you took into consideration while picking up the study. Okay, thank you. Um, the first question, why research